Okay, so I think we'll get started. So thank you everyone for attending. My name is Patrick Newman. I'm really excited to be presenting uh, the first day of Mises University and to talk about banking. So I guess I'm the I'm the meat in the Klein sandwich. So you're gonna have you got Sandy Klein, then you got me, and you got Peter Klein. So I'm in the middle. I'm supposed to keep everyone energized and you know really interested uh, in the material before the pool party. I guess so. You know, it's uh, it's a tough task, but I think I can do it. All right, so what's this presentation about and why should I care? All right, this is very important. Um, you know, why, why are you here? Why, what, what is the material that we're going to cover? Well, as the title of the lecture says, we're going to go through banking. We're going to go and do you know, why banks exist, what purposes uh, they serve in a market economy. We're going to go through the differences between loan banking and deposit banking. So these are two types of banking functions. We're going to go through, all right, uh, which one of these affects the money supply? Which one of them does not affect the money supply? What uh, roles do they serve? All right. We're going to, to talk about, well, the answer is how deposit banking affects the money supply, particularly through the process, what's known as credit expansion. Right. We're going to talk about how free banking, so freely competing banks, limits credit expansion. So under a fractional reserve system, we're going to go through Mises and Rothbard's arguments about how competition will not just cause banks to endlessly increase the money supply, but it will actually cause them to be relatively uh, restricted in how much they increase the money supply. Uh, in particular, we're going to go through what's known as the adverse clearing mechanism uh, when we describe this process. So this is a very important um, mechanism in a market economy. A lot of economists, they don't talk about it, they don't understand it, and this is why we continually hear the same fallacies about uh, freely competing um, uh, monetary institutions. All right. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how central banking affects the money supply. So we're going to bring in a central bank after we go through banking on the, uh, private, uh, on the private market, we're going to go through banking into the, um, into, into the uh, market with government intervention. All right. We're going to see uh, how banking can strengthen um, uh, what's known as bank cartels and lead to uh, much larger increases in the money supply than what's possible under free banking. And in doing so, we're going to go through the money multiplier process. So the step-by-step -step process of how money is created in the economy, uh, including uh, how money is created uh, over the past two years. As I'm sure many of us know, uh, the money supply has gone up. All right. So we've got a lot to cover. Uh, we've got 45 minutes. I, I think we'll get through it all. Um, so we're going to start off with what is money? Well, we know this from the last talk. It's a generally accepted medium of exchange. All right. To, you know, to, to, to sort of analyze this in a little bit more detail, we want to split this up into, all right, well, what, what are the types of money? So we have what's known as money proper, okay? And money proper, we think of it as the base money. Right? It's ultimately what we perceive as the foundation of the monetary economy. So we could have a commodity, such as gold or silver, or some form of, of cryptocurrency, right? This is a good that people value, um, not just for its use in money, but because it also satisfies wants. So gold and silver, uh, it's rare, could be used for religious or ornamental purposes, uh, et cetera. So gold has a value, all right? Um, aside from commodity money, we could have paper, which is uh, you know, made irredeemable by fiat. All right? this, is, uh, this is our version, our, 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 the modern version of money proper. Right? This is the dollar bills, as we'll, as I'll explain in a, in, a, in a minute or so, right? These dollar bills are not redeemable for anything, but we, st we view them as the base of the monetary system, all right? All right. So aside from money proper, we have uh, money substitutes, all right? So a money substitute is a claim to a fixed amount of money proper. More specifically, it's a, it's a claim that the public always perceives as redeemable for a fixed amount of money proper. It doesn't have to be legally uh, redeemable all the time for a fixed amount of money proper, just that the public has to perceive it, right? So our, uh, our, our bank accounts, we perceive that when we go to the bank, uh, we, we need to spend money or withdraw um, uh, money to get cash, money proper, uh, we will be able to do so, all right? So examples of money substitutes include bank notes, bank deposits, and so on, right? So I, I think it's helpful to illustrate 
what I mean by money proper in money substitute, um, which is why I've got some nice pictures here, because pictures can always make uh, bad presentations good. Uh, <laughs> so we've got uh, money proper uh, back in the day. So this is under the, the, the gold standard, right? This is a, a gold coin. It's, it says $5, right? So we learned in the last talk that uh, the dollar was defined as 1 20th an ounce of gold. So this is 1 4th um, an ounce of gold, all right? This is $5. So that's the money proper. This used to be the money substitute, okay? This is an example of a banknote. This is the St. Nicholas Bank. Yes, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus had his own bank back in the day. That's where do you think he got all the money to make all the toys, right? It's not, it's not magic. He was, he was doing it the old fashioned way. And uh, it says the St. Nicholas Bank will pay $5 to the bearer on demand. The public perceived that they could always redeem this for the money proper, all right? So again, this is what it says. Translated, the St. Nicholas Bank will pay $5, one fourth an ounce of gold to the bearer on demand. Right? So the money proper was the gold coins. The bank notes were not money proper. They were money substitutes because they could be redeemed for something else. All right, fast forward uh, 100 years or so. We're under the Federal Reserve System. So there are no more private bank notes. The central bank has taken control of, of, of the money supply. Only the central bank can issue notes. Right? So the dollar bills we have, they always say Federal Reserve notes. Uh, before we went, uh, we'll say about 100 years ago, say 1922, uh, you could have a, a $20 note. So $20 in gold coin, one ounce, payable to the bearer on demand. Right? It was still redeemable for uh, the money proper. Right. Well, by the time 1933 rolls around, uh, conditions have changed. Right? The, the contract has been altered. Right? So we, we, it was just imposed upon us. So now we can no longer redeem uh, our dollar bills for gold. It's just, that's, that's what it is. It's what it is, all right? Now we've just got these things, right? They just say Federal Reserve note, and they, they say $1. So if you go to a bank, you say, hi, I've got, I've got this note. I'd like to redeem it for a dollar. They're going to look at you a little funny, and they're going to give you another dollar. And you say, no, 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 I don't think you understand. I'm, I'm referring to the money proper. They're going to go, well, this is, this is all we have. There, 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 there's nothing else. It's just a dollar, right? We're, we're, we're completely removed from the, the monetary, uh, excuse me, we're completely removed from a commodity money. So now the money substitutes would be, uh, say, are the deposits we have at the banking system. And back in the day, you, know, you could spend this money uh, in your deposit using a check, writing a check. Most of us, we don't do that. We would instead have a debit card, all right? So a debit card, we could spend, uh, we need to spend $50 at the grocery store. Well, I would just take out my debit card. Uh, I perceive that I can always redeem the money uh, from this debit card. I could always get the money proper, the dollar bills from it. Uh, as does uh, you know, uh, the, the, the various people who are uh, selling goods, right? So this has now become the money substitute. Technically not the actual piece of plastic, but the, the money that uh, the, the, the account, the piece of plastic is linked to, all right? Okay, so we can now explain a little bit more about what a bank is. So a bank is an institution that makes loans uh, and or issues money substitutes. Right, this relates to the two functions of banking that we spoke about. All right, so the first function, making loans, this is called loan banking. As we'll see, loan banking does not involve any change in the money supply. It just simply involves a transfer of savings from one individual to another individual. Right? This is a very important function um, in, a, in a monetary economy. We cannot get by without loan banking. Right? The second function is called deposit banking. It, the, the issuance of money substitutes. As we'll see, there's a variety of reasons why people prefer money substitutes to money proper. Uh, the most basic reason is that money substitutes are much easier to uh, carry, right? And uh, there's better, uh, they're, they're, they're more secure, right? If your wallet gets stolen, uh, you can just cancel your debit card. You know, the cash in your wallet, uh, you, you can't really cancel that. that. You just have to treat that as lost, right? All right. So loan banking exists because financial intermediation lowers the cost of finding borrowers and lenders. Without a world of loan banking, let's say you had savings and you wanted to invest it. Right? So you got $1,000 in savings, you want to invest it. Well, how are you going to find someone uh, to borrow the money from you? 
You'd have to ask all your friends. You say, hey, I've got $1,000. Uh, would you like to take out a loan for me? And your friends are going to look at you kind of odd. You're going to have to ask more friends. You might have to ask your uh, family members and, you know, and relatives and so on. Uh, it's it's going to take a lot of time. Likewise, let's say you need to borrow money. You need $1,000 to meet some expenses or you're trying to start a business and so on. Well, without a bank, you'd have to go to all of your friends. You say, hey, I need $1,000. Can you lend me money? Uh, and you, know, you, you might find someone. Uh, you might fall into the wrong crowd. Uh, if you're borrowing money from someone. You know, it might have to be a criminal organization and, and so on. Uh, but you know, this would be very costly. You'd spend a lot of time trying to find uh, someone you could engage in an arrangement with. Well, instead, you've got a bank, right? You need to borrow money. You can go to the bank. You can borrow money. You need to uh, earn interest on your savings. Well, you can go to a bank and you can um, uh, you can lend them money. All right. Deposit banking exists because gold and silver coins or whatever other commodity we're using, they're cumbersome and they can be easily stolen. Right. You, you don't go to a grocery store and you hand them a bag of coins, right? And you say, "All right, I'd like to buy you know uh, two pounds of chicken." some rice, et cetera. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it take a lot of um, effort to carry around those gold coins. Uh, nowadays, even with cash, you still don't do that. If you need to make a large uh, you know, transaction, you need to purchase a car, you're not gonna have a huge uh, bag of cash, right? It would be hard to carry around, and if you lose that money, you're out of luck, right? Banknotes are much easier to carry. So back in the day, private banknotes were used primarily for small transactions. Whereas uh, debit cards or checks, et cetera, those can be precisely divided and they also require verification. So if they get stolen, uh, your money is safe. Uh, you know, or if someone has access to your debit card, you can easily cancel it. Right, these are very important features that, uh, very important functions, excuse me, that uh, we, modern society could not get by without. All right, just, as if, just as so modern society cannot rely on barter, Modern society requires uh, loan banks and deposit banks. All right, All right so let's analyze uh, these types of uh, uh, banking uh, practices a little bit more in depth. All right. So in order to do so, I'm going to use what's known as a T account or a balance sheet. I'm going to go through, OK, how banks will actually record uh, the process of them making loans. Uh, them accepting deposits, and so on. So let's start with loan banking. We're going to keep the example simple. And we're going to see how this uh, process works. All right, so let's assume we're on the gold standard. All right, we're going to go back to the good old days. All right, I'm saying this not because this isn't relevant for a non-gold standard, but I'm saying this because uh, I think this will better um, ex you know, help uh, illuminate uh, the processes that are going on here. So let's say we've got a young enterprising, intelligent entrepreneur, uh, say one Patrick Newman, and he's going to start a bank. He's going to decrease his consumption spending by $10,000, and he starts a bank with his savings. All right. So we've got the Newman Bank right here. We've got assets equals equity plus liability. So assets are things that you own. Liabilities are uh, what you owe. Right? And equity is what's left over. So it's net worth. So we're going to abstract from the building of the bank, you know, the actual building where the bank is located, any of the personnel, all of the, the, you know, the expenses, the vault, and so on. Uh, we're just going to look at the actual uh, financial transactions going on here. Uh, I have created my bank. On the, uh, under the assets column, I have gold. Right, that's worth $10,000. And under the equity and liabilities column, I have uh, just equity, net worth. Right? I haven't done anything with the money. So these two sides uh, of the financial ledger, so to speak, they always have to balance out. If they're not balancing out, that means something's wrong. Uh, someone's cooking the books. Uh, you gotta, gotta find out what's going on. But these, whenever you add something, you've always gotta add something to the other side and uh, the exact same thing when you uh, take something uh, off, right? So uh, we're going to assume that uh, I've got my bank set up and now I'm going to try to make money. All right, I, the, this balance sheet right now, I'm not making any money. I've just got gold sitting, uh, sitting in a vault, right? I want to now use these savings to actually um, start to make some money. In particular, I'm going to make a loan that I can earn interest from. So let's say the Newman Bank makes a loan to uh, one, John you know, one, one Jonathan, 
I uh, trust him. I right? say, so, uh, Jonathan, he's a, he's a good guy. Um, so we've got a new balance sheet here. Right? So what the main thing that's happened is on the left side, uh, gold has gone down by $9,000. And in place of that, I've got an IOU from Jonathan. This is an obligation. It's valued at $9,000 right now. In the future, say, you know, one year, however long the loan is, Jonathan's going to pay me back $9,000 plus interest. Okay. So this is now something that I can make money from. All right. So once again, $10,000 is equal to $10,000. At the end of this transaction, assuming Jonathan pays me back, I will have $10,000 in change. All right. This is how I'm able to embark upon a profitable business. All right, fairly simple here, right? Nothing um, too uh, complicated that's going on. Uh, just something that I want to point out is that the money supply has not changed. Only a change in uh, cash balances, right? Uh, the, the, the Newman Bank's uh, cash balance has gone down, right? Or in particular, initially the person putting the money in the bank, such as me, my cash balance has gone down, while Jonathan's has gone up. All right, there's been no change in the money supply. So we can make this a little bit more complicated by supposing that the Newman Bank is not only going to lend money, but it's going to borrow money. All right, so the Newman Bank is going to borrow money from people in the economy and going to turn around and then lend it. Now, why would they do that? Well, the idea is, say, they're going to borrow um, you know, $5,000 from a, a Ludwig, right? and they're going to pay Ludwig in one year 3% interest, well, the Newman Bank's going to turn around and then lend that $5,000 at 5% interest. Right? They're going to make uh, money from doing so. This is not, uh, you know, I'm not exploiting Ludwig or the person who's, who the money's being lent to. This is a normal process of financial intermediation. The Newman Bank is undergoing the costs uh, involved in this uh, process of finding borrowers and lenders. Right? So suppose the Newman Bank borrows $5,000 uh, from Ludwig in the form of certi certificate of deposits, type of financial instrument I will talk about in a second. All right. So here's what the balance sheet looks like now. Now on the right side, liabilities, uh, there is a certificate of deposit, a COD, to Ludwig for $5,000. That means is that in one year, I will have to pay Ludwig $5,000 plus interest. Right. On the other side, the asset side, I have an IOU from whomever the Newman Bank is lending the money to, say the Mises Institute, right? So it borrows money from Ludwig, turns around, and then lends that money to the Mises Institute, okay? So now the balance sheet of the Newman Bank has increased from $10,000 to $15,000, okay? It's important to note that the COD, the Certificate of Deposit, even though it's got the word deposit in it, a little confusing. It's not a money substitute. Right? Ludwig, when he puts his money in this type of financial instrument, he cannot spend it. He has uh, relinquished his ability to spend the money. He is channeling his savings through the Newman Bank. Okay, and what that means is that the um, I'm sorry. So the Newman Bank then makes a five thousand dollar loan to the Mises Institute. We just showed that. Um, what that means is the money supply remains constant. Because all that happens is Ludwig's cash balance has gone down by $5,000, while the Mises Institute's cash balance has gone up by $5,000. And at the end of this transaction, the Mises Institute will repay the Newman Bank, right? And then the Newman Bank will repay Ludwig, right? And everyone's happy. Everyone benefits from this. The Newman Bank, in particular, is going to make a slight profit on the transaction, right? And so loan banking has proceeded in this fashion for hundreds of years. Sometimes the loans are successful. Sometimes the loans aren't successful. That's just a normal process of entrepreneurship, figuring out uh, who are good lenders, who are good borrowers, so on and so forth. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we can now move on to deposit banking, a uh, much more prominent feature uh, of, 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 the, uh, of, of the monetary economy I want to talk about, um, especially because it relates to monetary policy and central banking and so on. So we're going to shift gears. We're going to look at a deposit bank. Now, in reality, throughout history, most banks have combined both functions. There's been some types of just pure loan banks. Uh, historically, those were called investment banks. 
really most modern banks have, are, are both engaged in deposit banking as well as loan banking. So we're going to start over, have a complete uh, clean balance sheet, right? And we're going to see how this process unfolds. So suppose Bob, one Bob, deposits $10,000 of gold at the Newman Bank, right? Why would Bob do this? Well, again, Bob wants to uh, you know, store his money at the bank. He doesn't want to have to deal with the difficulty of carrying around these coins. He doesn't want to have to deal with the potential uh, you know, um, uh, threat, or I guess the, the problem where his money could get stolen. Right? This is the completely normal behavior. So he deposits $10,000 of gold at the Newman Bank. Here's what the balance sheet looks like. Okay, we're going to abstract from the equity in the Newman Bank. Again, I'm just starting over, simplified balance sheet. Uh, on the right side, we've got uh, you know, the deposit to Bob, and that's $10,000. That's a liability. On the left side, we've got um, you know, $10,000 in gold. In particular, we've got $10,000 in gold reserves. So things are a little bit different right now, which is why it's important to go through what's happening. Right? So unlike the certificate of deposit, uh, a deposit in, 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 in this sense, such as a checking deposit or a demand deposit, uh, as they're often called, is a money substitute. Okay? Bob can spend it. He gets an account that you know, he, he, could, uh, he could write a check on for $6,000, for $4,000, uh, you know, whatever, and uh, you know, he could spend it at a store or he could redeem it for the money proper. He says, eh, you know what, I actually want to now hold some of my money in gold in the form of gold, right? Bob could also convert it into banknotes, right? Let's say he doesn't want to uh, make all of his transactions with a, uh, a checkbook or a debit card, right? He could, uh, he, he could, he could use banknotes uh, to purchase goods at the store. And all this would mean is that if Bob wants to convert his deposit into banknotes, say $5,000 into banknotes, well, the Newman Bank would just have now $5,000 in the form of a deposit and $5,000 in the form of banknotes, right? Nothing too complicated there, right? It's important to note that, at least so far, the money supply has not changed. Only the composition of Bob's cash balance. Uh, just to uh, reiterate this point, I believe it was mentioned in the last lecture, uh, a cash balance does not just refer to the money you have as cash or as a wallet, right? I have my wallet. I've got a cash balance, uh, and, excuse me, I've got, I've got $60 in cash. That's not my cash balance, right? The cash balance is all of the money that you could spend, right? So it also includes the four or $5 million I have in my checking account at Bank of America. Okay, all right, just want to make sure we're all, we're all paying attention. Don't worry, uh, inflation hasn't gotten that bad yet, so we're good. <laughs> okay, um, all right. So a couple other things to point out, make sure we're understanding uh, what's going on here. So right now, the Newman Bank operates with, at a 100% reserve ratio, right? Because those that gold is uh, in gold reserves, right? Because Bob might want to redeem some of his deposit for gold. So now the Newman Bank has to have gold on hand in order to be able to satisfy uh, Bob's uh, you know, desire, right? So it's 100% reserve ratio. A reserve ratio is equal to reserves uh, divided by deposits uh, or notes, if they were, if, if those um, if we had them in this example, times 100, right? So it's 10,000 divided by 10,000 times 100 equals 100%, right? So um, from this very simple example, we know a couple things, right? First, we know that uh, Austrians can do math. <laughs> Uh, and the second thing we know is that there's been no credit expansion, no change in the money supply uh, as of yet. All right. OK. Um, <clears throat> so all money substitutes are what Mises called money certificates. That means there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the money substitute and the money certificate. In a sense, they're just almost a, a receipt or a warehouse receipt, maybe not legally, but economically. Right. You, the Bob can just go to the bank, redeem $1, $2, $9,000, dollars $10,000 for whatever amount of gold uh, he wants, and he will be able to do so. Okay. All right. But the process doesn't stop there. Uh, in particular, the Newman Bank needs to make money, right? Because the Newman Bank has accepted this, uh, this gold deposit. The Newman Bank has to provide various services 
uh, to Bob, such as allowing him to spend the money, allowing him to redeem the money. Uh, there's the cost of storage, right? Having guards around the, the bank vault, uh, all sorts of technology, other stuff. There's got to be a way for the Newman Bank to make money on this. So what the Newman Bank is going to do, at least in the modern economy, is the Newman Bank's going to make a loan. All right, now we'll, we'll see that in reality, they're not going to make a $90,000 loan to Jim. Right? It's going to be a different amount, but we're going to see how this example unfolds. So the Newman Bank will make a $90,000 loan to Jim. Right? Here's what's going to happen. The Newman Bank will open up a deposit for Jim. All right? So it's saying, all right, we're going to make you a loan uh, in the, for the amount of $90,000. Uh, we're just going to open up an account for you, and you will be able to spend this money according to uh, the terms of the loan. Say Jim needs this to start a business, so we'll sign a contract. It'll say, all right, you'll get $90,000. You have to pay us back, the Newman Bank, $90,000 plus interest, uh, a certain amount of time in the future. On the other hand, the Newman Bank receives an IOU from Jim. All right, this is valuable, right? because this could be, in a sense, sold on the market to other banks, uh, this will earn interest, right? This is this is important. This is a this is a, a, a profit making activity, right? Now the balance sheet has increased from ten thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, right? Once again, both sides balance each other out. All right. What the Newman Bank has done is it's engaged in credit expansion. It's increased the money supply by making loans. This is different than under loan banking, because under loan banking, only the, the composition of cash balances uh, changed, or you know, someone's cash balance went up, someone's cash balance went down. Now under deposit banking, uh, the bank has literally increased the money supply right, in the form of a loan, right? because this loan uh, can be redeemed for gold right, by Jim or by whoever else has um, uh, this, this, um, this deposit, right? as well as Bob. Right? Bob can still redeem his, his deposit for gold. Right? So the money supply has increased. Right? This is a fairly large increase in the money supply, at least just based off of our simple example. We'll see how this actually won't occur on the market. Right? We just have to follow the logic through here. Right? So $100,000 are money substitutes. The public perceives these as always being redeemable for gold. But only $10,000 are money certificates, because there's only $10,000 in, uh, uh, in reserve. The rest uh, it's, are unbacked money substitutes, as they're called. And they're, they're what's known as fiduciary media. Okay? So the money substitutes in the economy are always equal to the money certificates plus the fiduciary media in economy. All right? uh, in an economy with fractional reserve banking, as we have here, there will be fiduciary media. It just won't be a perfect correspondence. Uh, between uh, money certificates and money substitutes. All right. So this bank, as I've said, is engaging in fractional reserve banking. It's operating at a 10% fractional reserve ratio. Right? Uh, there's $10,000 in gold. There's $100,000 in uh, uh, money substitutes. Right? So something important to note is that uh, sometimes this is known, this is called, this is fraudulent, Oh, the, the Newman Bank is, 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 is not able to satisfy all withdrawals, so it's engaging in some sort of uh, malfeasance here. Something's going on. Well, how these contracts legally are arranged is they're in the form of what's known as a call loan. Even though the public perceives them as always being redeemable, right? they perceive them as warehouse receipts. Economically, legally, they, they are loans. Right? Legally, they are a form of a loan. Okay, It's important to know. So what's also important to note is the Newman Bank cannot meet all potential withdrawals, but it estimates it will never have to. So yes, in theory, $100,000 uh, worth of money substitutes could end up at the Newman Bank's door, and it won't uh, obviously have the money, so it would go bankrupt. It would have to sell assets uh, that, you know, in, in, you know, for gold, um, or it would have to close its doors. When, there, when a bank has enough reserves to meet uh, current demand, for money proper, it's what's known as liquid. Okay, banks uh, always want to be liquid. If they don't have enough money, they're going to be illiquid. Okay, they're going to have to do something uh, in order to acquire money, or as I said, they're going to go bankrupt. Right? 
So banks are always going to try to be liquid. Uh, if, they're not, if they're not liquid, then they're in trouble. So um, every bank, every fractional reserve bank is, is always facing the, the, the potential threat of being uh, a liquid, but it makes an entrepreneurial estimation as to how much its customers will actually want uh, in gold and silver. This is similar to a airline company. They're going to issue out more airline tickets than seats are available because they estimate that some people won't show up. Or an insurance company uh, is going to uh, grant out, uh, you know, in theory, uh, grant out more uh, types of uh, you know, fire policies for fire insurance uh, than the money it has available. So if the entire town of Auburn burns up, um, the, the local fire insurance companies will go bankrupt. All right? But they just estimated that won't happen. Okay. All right, so you might say, well, wait a second. A mainstream economist says, well, if banks can increase the money supply, they're going to do so endlessly. They can just literally engage in credit expansion, as you've, as you've shown, and the money supply will go up. Uh, you know, bank, uh, bank assets will balloon from $10,000 to $100,000, so on and so forth. You know, right? Just print the money out of thin air. Back in the day, this was called wildcat banking. So we, 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 there, are, there are articles on this continually. Um, old myths die hard. So the, the idea was in the 1800s, uh, these, these flyby banks would be created where the wildcats roamed out in the boonies, and they would issue a bunch of money. Uh, the, the money supply would, 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 would shoot up, and then they would close their doors but, and, and, and quickly skip town, right? And the, the public would be uh, bamboozled. And we've heard the same thing regarding cryptocurrency. Oh, all these crypto exchanges, they're just like the modern day form of a wildcat bank. So the first thing I did is, uh, when I was, was working on these slides, I said, all right, well, I have to find a picture of a wildcat bank. Right, who's a wildcat banker? Right, so I go on Google, I type in wildcat banker. I get this. All right, uh, it's a cat. He's a banker. He says, you silly upstarts, only we bankers can make money from thin air. Right, I guess this is a wildcat bank. Uh, this is a wildcat banker. He's running the institution. Um, uh, this wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but anyway, something to keep in mind. Right? In reality, there is no uh, wildcat banking would not occur on the free market. Okay? To the extent it did occur, uh, and the, the quantitative effects of this are greatly overstated in the past, uh, it was due to government intervention. Right? In reality, as the Austrian economists, Mises and Rothbard and others have explained, is that competition is going to limit credit expansion. Right? This is because of the adverse clearing mechanism. So credit expansion will cause an outflow of reserves. So if one bank actually does expand the money supply by $90,000, um, as we'll see, uh, you know, given the, the, its gold reserves, it would quickly go bankrupt. Okay? So the fact that there are multiple banks eager to redeem other banks' money substitutes for the real deal for money proper really limits uh, credit expansion on a free market. Okay. So let's, let's look at this process in a little bit more detail. So let's say if the Newman Bank makes the $90,000 loan, it's going to go bankrupt. Now, why is this? Because let's say Jim is going to spend the money. He needs to expand his business. He's going to spend the money at Ace Hardware. Uh, Ace Hardware receives uh, Jim's um, uh, you know, the, the debit card transaction, and it's then going to deposit the money at the Bank of Salerno, a okay, very prestigious rival bank to the Bank of Newman. Um, now, the bank owners are friends. They're not that good of friends. Okay? What's going to happen is the owner of the bank of, 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 of Salerno is going to present the obligation to Patrick Newman for redemption in gold. Uh, you've got, I've got this $90,000 uh, check. I, I, would, I, I, want, I want the real deal. All right, give me $90,000 in gold coin. The Newman Bank doesn't have that. It's only got $10,000. Right? So the Newman Bank would go bankrupt. Right? So, Far from increasing the money supply um, endlessly, uh, free banking you know, on, on the free market it severely limits credit expansion. All right. OK. So competition severely limits credit expansion. This is something that uh, continually needs to be repeated. All right. So Austrians were very big on competition, uh, not only for the production of ordinary goods, but also uh, in the monetary sphere. 
you might say, well, wait a second. What if banks form a cartel to coordinate credit expansion? So what happens if the Newman Bank, the owner of the Newman Bank and the Bank of Salerno, they really are that good of friends, okay? And they say, all right, look, uh, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. I won't redeem your uh, money substitutes for gold if you don't redeem my money substitutes for gold, all right? Now, what would happen is this would fail uh, because of what's known as internal and external pressure, okay? Internal pressure refers to cheating among members of the cartel, right? So even though the Newman Bank and the Bank of Salerno made this agreement, uh, the next day, uh, several months later, et cetera, we could secretly cheat. Okay? This happens all the time with cartels. And then there's external pressure in the form of other banks in the domestic economy, uh, in different countries, so for the foreign banks, et cetera. They're going to want to redeem the money substitutes for gold. So the cartels, uh, to solve this problem of credit expansion, at least on the free market, they're not effective. Right? So how could a banking cartel uh, become effective? All right. Well, enter the central bank. All right. The central bank uh, will basically help bankers increase uh, credit expansion. A uh, modern central bank has five important characteristics. Right. Got a monopoly on note issuance. Banks cannot issue private notes anymore. Only the central bank can. And then usually what happens is that uh, these notes are no longer even redeemable in gold. Right? Federal Reserve was created in 1913. Well, just 20 years later, uh, we're off the gold standard. We have, we have, we have domestic gold standard, at least. It's also a banker's bank where now banks hold their reserves at the central bank. So the Newman Bank is going to store all of its gold reserves at, uh, um, at, at the Federal Reserve, let's say. It's also going to be a regulator, a regulator of reserve requirements for uh, various commercial banks, all right? It's going to be a lender of last resort, okay? So if banks are experiencing difficulties, um, in uh, satisfying customers' um, uh, demands for money proper, they're going to be able to turn to the bank, all right? Excuse me, they're going to be able to turn to the central bank, all right? And the central bank will be able to provide them the money they need. And then last but not least, uh, it's a conductor of monetary policy. So it can, central banks will try to change the money supply, uh, and interest rates in order to stabilize or try to stabilize economic activity, right? So central banking strengthens bank cartels by easily increasing bank reserves, right? So now what the central bank can do is it can pr print money out of thin air. It will, it does not hold a gold reserve, right? It can just literally create money and it can provide this money to banks. So it can provide uh, dollar bills to, to, uh, to banks and they can use that to now increase um, uh, their amount of uh, loans, right? To engage in credit expansion. All right, the, so the modern central bank has four tools uh, it uses to affect economic activity. Right? It can engage in open market operations. Right? This is the buying and selling of uh, assets from a bank. So buying and selling of government securities, right? Um, and it can, it can give uh, banks money uh, for, their, uh, for, for the assets it has. A discount window, it can lend um, banks money. It can charge them a discount rate, right? It can set reserve requirements. So instead of banks deciding what reserve ratio they want to hold, the uh, central bank can say, all right, well, now you only have to hold 5% uh, reserves or 2% reserves. Or as in the modern economy, it's basically 0%, right? The central bank has that power, okay? And then lastly, it could pay interest on bank reserves uh, held at the central bank, okay? This is a relatively new um, uh, mo monetary tool. Uh, it was very prevalent in the, uh, in the 2010s, okay? Uh, but ever since COVID, we've kind of just switched back to the central bank, just buys a bunch of stuff on the open market and lends money to banks, right? So just. Uh, simple, simpler times, you could say. Right? <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll finish up uh, by briefly looking at open market operations in the so-called money multiplier. So this is actually how the process, the process of how uh, the money supply increases under a fractional reserve system. Okay. So 
as we're going to see, it's not going to occur. What's, what's, what's not going to happen is that one bank will just make a loan uh, much larger than the increase in reserves it held. Instead, it's going to be a much smaller step-by-step -step process. All right. The old market operations explain. Let's say we've got the Federal Reserve, the institution we all know and love here at the Mises Institute. It writes a $1,000 check to bond dealers, let's say Powell and Sons, uh, and it prints money out of thin air. Right? So Powell and Sons will take this check and it will deposit it at the Newman Bank. All right, we've got the Newman Bank. Uh, here's its balance sheet right, uh, right here. Uh, assets, it's got reserves of $1,000. It has deposited this um, at, the, uh, at, at, the, at the Fed, right? It's not shown. Um, on, under its liabilities, it's got a deposit to Powell and Sons for $1,000, right? Once again, $1,000, uh, $1,000. Everything's, everything's balanced out. So the Newman Bank will only engage in credit expansion by the following amount, uh, by the change in reserves it's gotten, so $1,000 times 1 minus the reserve requirement. Okay. And let's say the Federal Reserve sets the reserve requirement at 10%. Okay. So what that means is now the Newman Bank will expand credit by $900, $1,000 times 0.9, um, and let's say it makes a loan to Bernanke and Co. All right, so another uh, another esteemed institution. Okay. So what's going to happen is we've got an updated balance sheet. So the Newman Bank uh, will you know have a deposit uh, to Bernanke and Co. on the right side, and then on the left side it's going to get an IOU from Bernanke and Co. So it's got nineteen hundred dollars. On, uh, the, on the left side and $1,900 on the right side. Everything, once again, balances out. Okay. That should strictly say $900 equals 1,000 times 0.9 uh, on the slide over there. All right. So what's going to happen? What would actually happen um, in, in this situation? All right. So now when the Bank of Salerno redeems, we'll just follow through the process that say that Bernanke and Co. spends the money at Ace Hardware, uh, and Ace Hardware deposits at the uh, you know, banks at the Bank of Salerno. Now when the Bank of uh, Salerno goes to the Newman Bank with a $900 obligation, uh, there will be enough reserves, right? $1,000, right? So what will happen is then the deposit to Bernanke and Co. will get canceled out and the reserves will go down by $900. So we're back to 1,000. But the Newman Bank wants to do this because it's, again, it's making loans, it's earning interest, and so on, right? The process, though, does not end there. The Bank of Salerno is going to expand credit by the same formula, $900 times 0.9, that's $810, right? The next bank, Herbner and Rittenauer Incorporated follows with the same, uh, you know, you're following the same formula, it's $729, so on and so forth, right? So the money supply is increasing in a step-by-step -step process, right? Each bank is increasing the money supply by a smaller and smaller amount. Initially, money supply went up by $1,000, then it went, went up by $900, then it went up by $810, $729, and so on. Okay, and we could say this is equal to the formula change in reserves times one divided by the reserve ratio uh, equals $10,000. Okay, so the central bank could just increase as much money uh, as it wants to, right? Just pump in more reserves. Magic, just like that, all right? So with each new loan from credit expansion, the money supply increases. And it's injected into the economy at a specific point, raising prices and changing production unevenly in a step-by-step -step fashion. All right, so when the money supply increases, it doesn't just raise prices proportionally. It raises some prices more than others. Um, so prices rise unevenly. Okay. But the important thing to remember is this. You know, we've covered a lot of material uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. The important thing to remember is this. When the money supply goes up, prices will go up. This is a... A forgotten truth in economics, apparently. Now, this is something uh, Austrians have to uh, teach um, people, or really more specifically, central bankers again. Right? So, 
Don't forget that prices go up. So if you increase the money supply through credit expansion by more than 40% over two years, which is what we did, prices, consumer prices, are going to rise by at least 9%, okay? Now, that might confuse some people, but <laughs> the basic point is this. You cannot get rid of scarcity, all right? You cannot just print more money and not expect it to increase the demand for goods and drive up prices, okay? That's a consequence of the banking system. Now, you might learn it's due to supply shocks or corporate greed, but price rise is due to that. That statistic there, okay? So I think with that, I will end. Uh, thank you for, for listening. For more, I encourage you to read Murray Rothbard's Mystery of Banking and Bob Murphy's Understanding Money Mechanics. Thank you so much.